Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, another study has added fuel to the flames of the Spinosaurus Wars, a new species of dinosaur has been discovered, a new pterosaur species has been named, and much more. Starting off the news this week, we're once again lucky enough to bring you good news about Voyager 1, humanity's first interstellar object. Voyager 1 encountered an error with its onboard systems that meant it couldn't send vital science and engineering data back to NASA here on Earth, limiting its ability to both collect scientific data and look after itself. Eventually, NASA was able to bypass this issue by splitting the corrupted data to other parts of this subsystem, which meant that the team working on this had the tricky ordeal of splitting up some of the code that the craft was generating to send back and be reassembled in a usable format here on Earth. Well, back in April, we were delighted to report that NASA had regained access to Voyager's engineering data, and now we can tell you that full scientific function has been restored as well. About a month ago, the team working on solving the issue managed to get two out of the four scientific instruments back up and running, but the final two required some extra work that has now been completed. Now we can be assured that, for the moment at least, it can keep sending us data from this ridiculous distance. Voyager 1 is currently over 15 billion miles away from Earth, so trying to fix the craft is excruciating work, as any signal would take nearly a full 24 hours to reach the probe, and then the same time again to come back. Congratulations to the whole team for accomplishing this amazing feat. It was never in doubt, but mightily impressive nonetheless. In other news, we're sticking with outer space, as we take a look at a study that has come to the conclusion that the brightening up of a distant galaxy 300 million light years away is actually the awakening of a supermassive black hole at its core. Supermassive black hole. Twilight. Such an event has never been witnessed in real time before, so it's somewhat of a mystery to astronomers who first observed this galactic brightening back in December 2019. Events that cause brightness on a truly colossal scale have been witnessed before, such as supernovas, but what made this event different was how long it lasted. Supernovas can last a couple of weeks, and some can last much longer, but not as nearly as long as this event, which has been getting brighter for years and is continuing to this day. This, and some other differences, prompted astronomers to take a closer look at this strange happening, and realised that what they were seeing was probably the core of the galaxy starting to show activity. Like our own galaxy, this distant one has a supermassive black hole at its core, and this is the first time we've been able to witness the activation of this supermassive black hole, as it begins to consume enormous amounts of gas around it. It's not a process that we know a great deal about, but hopefully observing this particular event will be invaluable in learning more about something that may indeed happen to our own supermassive black hole one day. There is a lot of cetacean news to report this week, and unfortunately it is not good news. Firstly, the Icelandic Minister of Fisheries has issued a permit to the whaling company Havala to hunt 128 fin whales this summer. Apparently, the current law on whale hunting is such that issuing a licence to hunt whales is unavoidable. The government wants to ban whale hunting by law, but they don't have the parliamentary majority to do so. The CEO of Havala is unhappy, as he believes that the permit has been granted too late for him to do any whaling this summer. The fact that the company managed to hunt 24 fin whales last year in an even shorter season seems to have escaped him. In the second bit of cetacean news, a recently published paper reveals that a small subset of about 200 grey whales within the larger eastern North Pacific population of about 14,500 has reduced in size by 13% over the last 20 years or so. This subgroup stays close to the shore along the Oregon coast, feeding in shallow warm waters rather than the Arctic seas, where the bulk of the grey whale population spends most of the year. Their decrease in body mass raises concerns about the health and reproductive success of these grey whales and, as whales are considered ecosystem sentinels, if the whale's population is unhealthy, that could mean that the environment is also unhealthy in some way. And lastly, but by no means least, 
there has been a recent census of the population of Vaquita, and sadly its numbers continue to dwindle. This sweet, tiny porpoise faces extinction due to becoming entangled in grill nets and drowning. They are only found in the upper Gulf of California on the west coast of Mexico, and despite measures to protect them, the number counted this year is between 6 and 8, which is down from the 8 to 13 spotted last year. Time is running out for them. If you would like to know about the beautiful Bakita or whaling by Iceland, then One World has a video on each of these subjects, and there is a link to them in the sources. Well, the paleontology news for this week has been absolutely action-packed, so let's get into it. First up, a new species of pterosaur has been named. This is a particularly exciting new species, as it is the most complete pterosaur to have ever been found in Australia so far. It's been named Haley Skyer Petersoni, honouring Kevin Peterson who found and prepped the specimen, and Haley Skyer from the ancient Greek for sea shadow, referencing how it was a flying creature that cast a shadow on the sea. The fossil was uncovered in Queensland, and in rocks dating to just over 100 million years ago. A partial skull is preserved, along with many teeth, some vertebrae, ribs, bones from the shoulder, parts of the wing, and pieces of the hind limbs. The skull shows that Halis Gaia had curved teeth and a crest on its snout, which along with other features indicate that this was a type of pterosaur called an anhanguerin, potentially related to species such as Ornithocyrus, although its precise relationships are not clear. It had an estimated wingspan of 4.6 metres, or about 15 feet, and likely fed on fish and cephalopods that inhabited the ancient sea that covered this part of Australia. It's a fantastic new species that tells us a lot more about the very rare Australian pterosaurs. Next up, we also have a new dinosaur species this week. It comes from late Cretaceous Age rocks in northern Patagonia, dating to between 86 and 83 million years ago, and has been named Diaquin lecheguini. Linguini, Lechiguane, and has been named Diaquin Lechiguane, with Diaquin being the word for a bird of prey in the language of the Mapuche people indigenous to this region of Patagonia. Not a lot of the skeleton has been preserved, with two pieces of vertebrae and a complete left humerus being described, plus four unidentified fragments of bone. However, the anatomical features of the humerus have enabled paleontologists to identify it as belonging to the Unanlargine subfamily, a group of theropod dinosaurs that are potentially members of the dromaeosaurids, although that has been debated. Interestingly, the humerus of Diaquin shows features that seem to be intermediate between older and enlargings and the younger, scarily big Ostraraptor of Argentina, possibly indicating that Diaquin represents a sort of transitional stage in the evolution of these dinosaurs. The humerus fossil also displays some bite marks near one end that appear to be feeding traces made by a conical toothed crocodiliform, mammal, or maybe another theropod dinosaur. So there's also an interesting instance of interactions between extinct animals preserved here too. Another wonderful new discovery. And to top off the list of new prehistoric reptile species this week, we also have a new ichthyosaur species, which Ben is very excited about again. I love ichthyosaurs. This new species is a kind of mixosaur, a group of very early ichthyosaurs that lived during the Triassic period and which show a mixture of features from older groups of more eel-shaped ichthyosaurs as well as younger groups of more dolphin-shaped ones, which explains the name. It's been called Mixosaurus luciensis and is known from an amazing, almost complete skeleton found in southern China. The anatomical features of its skull, teeth and forelimb all indicate that this is a new animal, distinct from other species of Mixosaurus and its description adds lots of new data to our understanding of this early group of these amazing marine reptiles. Some more very cool ichthyosaur news up next as a fascinating new study has looked at how the flippers of this marine reptiles evolved across time. Ichthyosaur fins are quite complex structures made of many small finger bones, with many species adding lots of extra bones and even some entire extra fingers to make up these paddle-like structures. These fins were important for manoeuvring the animals underwater and keeping them stable, while their tails provided thrust. This new research has explored the diversity of paddles among derived Jurassic and Cretaceous ichthyosaur groups, finding that the diversity of bone arrangements was actually surprisingly diverse, with lots of different ways that they made up the paddle shape. A very interesting thing that the scientists also noticed was that in some members of a certain dried ichthyosaur subfamily, there were small ball and socket joints between the end of the humerus and one of the extra added digit bones. 
So as well as having the main ball and socket joint where the humerus met the pectoral girdle, the actual paddles seem to have had some internal flexibility that the authors compared to the allula of bird wings, essentially the bird's thumb that controls the angle of attack. Some really intriguing new ichthyosaur discoveries then. Also in the news this week, the Spinosaurus Wars rage on as yet another paper has been published investigating its possible lifestyle. This time, paleontologists have used a method of analysing the shape and anatomy of Spinosaurus skulls and compared them to the skulls of other terrestrial theropods, plus birds, crocs and marine reptiles such as plesiosaurs and mosasaurs. By taking certain measurements of the skulls of all of these animals and plotting how they vary onto a graph, the researchers were able to show that the animals with terrestrial Terrestrial ecologies were significantly distinct from semi and fully aquatic ecologies, but the semi and fully aquatic ecologies were not that different from one another. The spinosaurs were found to plot away from all the terrestrial theropods and were close to marine species and wading birds. In fact, on these plots here you can see how Spinosaurus itself falls right in with the mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, which is very interesting. The authors note how similar biomechanical restrictions work on species that feed on aquatic prey and so you can get a lot of convergent evolution in the skull shapes of both semi-aquatic and fully aquatic species. Meaning that species such as Spinosaurus, which have an uncertain ecology, cannot be categorised with certainty based on only skull shape. However, they did find that Spinosaurs, and especially Spinosaurus itself, had similar positioning of the nostril openings to what we see in certain birds, in particular big fish-eating species. Therefore, they explain that such a nostril positioning would have been very beneficial for a lifestyle in which Spinosaurus was a wader in shallow waters and would stand and wait for prey, whereas it's unclear what benefit it would have had for an underwater pursuit hunting lifestyle. So it's another study in favour of the wading heron-like lifestyle hypothesis for this controversial dinosaur rather than supporting it being a specialised swimmer. When will the Spinosaurus Wars end? Another very interesting study has been published this week in which paleontologists have micro CT scanned a remarkable specimen of a creature called Dicynodont to reconstruct its skull anatomy, including details of its brain structure. This animal, nicknamed the Elgin Marvel, was discovered near Elgin in northeast Scotland and lived not long before the great dying mass extinction event about 252 million years ago, the worst extinction this planet has suffered. It's a species called Gordonia and it's a prehistoric relative of mammals. The Elgin Marvel fossil is quite unusual for its preservation since it's preserved as an empty void space in a sandstone rock. So the actual bones are not there, but the mould they left in the rock is. Reconstructions of the fossil based on the cavity have been made previously, but this new study has now micro CT scanned the rock, enabling scientists to learn a lot more about the details of the skull and brain of this animal and to make comparisons with related species. The study shows how the use of these scanning techniques can reveal so much about these ancient animals preserved in this very interesting and unique way. And finally for the news this week, a very interesting short correspondence has been published reporting on the discovery of the oldest Sauropterygian marine reptile from the Southern Hemisphere. The Sauropterygians include several diverse and amazing group of extinct marine reptiles, most notably the plesiosaurs and pliosaurs, but our understanding of their early evolution during the Triassic period has only been based on fossils found in the Northern Hemisphere. This publication now reports the discovery of a basal Sauropterygian, an animal called Nothosaurus from the mid-Triassic of New Zealand, dating to just after about 246 million years ago. The fossil itself is an isolated vertebra that displays nothosaurian features and indicates that Sauropterygians must have very quickly diversified and radiated globally not long after the great dying mass extinction event, with this new fossil revealing their unexpected presence at this high paleo latitude. Another very intriguing new discovery. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, be sure to go follow our TikTok and Instagram accounts if you'd like for more paleontological news updates and short form videos about various extinct animals. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.